All right. Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jessica Cecil. I'm the Education Coordinator at the National Aging Research Institute. Uh, welcome to our online seminars and aging program. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which each of us are meeting today and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Uh, firstly, a little housekeeping regarding Zoom. At the conclusion of the talk, we'll have some time for Q&A. Uh, if you have any questions, you can submit them throughout the seminar using the chat function, which can be opened using the chat tab at the bottom of your screen. Uh, so today we'll be hearing from Associate Professor Hannah Keege from the University of South Australia. Uh, Hannah completed her PhD at Flinders University and has undertaken postdoctoral positions at the University of Cambridge and held an EC Marie Curie Fellowship. Uh, in 2011, she returned to Australia, taking up an academic uh, position in psychology at the University of South Australia. Uh, since then, she's held NHMIC Early Career and Boosting Dementia Research Leadership Fellowships and is currently an Associate Professor of Psychology, President of the Australian um, Cognitive Neuroscience Society and member of the Australian Academy for Sciences Committee for the Brain and Mind and co-lead of the Cognitive Aging and Impairment Neurosciences Lab. Uh, her work fo focuses on cognitive aging and cognitive impairments, uh, such as dementia and delirium, using neuropsychological and uh, psychophysiological approaches. So today she'll be presenting uh, the importance of delirium in the development of late life dementia. Uh, welcome, Hannah. Very much looking forward to hearing your presentation today. Thank you uh, so much for the invitation. Uh, and um, as a I mean, I'm sorry we're not all like traveling and, and visiting each other as a, I, I'm a Melbourneite. So um, hopefully I can visit you one day soon. But thank you so much for the invitation to present to you from Adelaide. That's where our um, research group is based. And as, the, um, as I was introduced, I'm gonna be talking about the importance of delirium in the development of late life dementia. And most of this talk I'm gonna be touching on a number of the projects and papers that we've been working on in the last few years. So please do get in touch if this overlaps with your own work or you're interested or you'd like to collaborate. We're really wanting to pursue um, this research area more so in the future. Hmm. Okay. So um, first of all, many of you on, on this um, webinar will already know what delirium is, but I, I'd like to briefly um, operationalize it uh, before, before we launch into the research. So delirium is in the DSM, it's in the ICD, it's a neurocognitive disorder, and it's precipitated by an acute insult. So that could be a systemic infection, that could be a surgery or procedure, but there's something that, that sort of precipitates uh, the process and um, that manifests as delirium. It's acute in presentation. Someone could be fine at 10 a.m., but at 2 p.m. they have delirium. So you can see how this is different from dementia, which is chronic and progressive. Delirium typically fluctuates. So people will go in and out of sort of mild symptoms to, to more moderate or severe symptoms. And this could be over hours, someone could have a delirium episode just for a few hours. It could be for a few days, in rarer cases, weeks. And it's sort of in one or 2% of cases, this can go on for, for months. It's characterized by a disturbance in attention and awareness. And with this goes um, sort of deficits in arousal. There has to be another disturbance in cognition. So that could be language or memory. It can't be better explained by a pre-existing disorder or coma. And really importantly, especially in the context of some of the work we've been doing, it can be categorized into three subtypes. So just like there are different subtypes of dementia, there are different subtypes of delirium. The first is hypoactive. That's the most common where people display hypoactivity. So very little motor activity, very little speech. They might be quite difficult to rouse and to interact with, to uh, you know, obtain some complete um, responses and sentences. There's a hyperactive delirium, which as the name suggests, um, hyperactivity, lots of speech, um, lots of motor movement. And it can also um, have uh, symptoms of delusions and hallucinations, which can be particularly distressing for 
patients and their caregivers. And you can have mixed, which has symptoms of both. So it not only varies in terms of its presentation with its subtype, but also in terms of its severity and its duration. Delirium is important because it's pretty much associated with every poor outcome you could ever imagine for an older person. So it's in, so associated with higher mortality, higher institutionalization, higher frailty, a longer hospital length, stay length, more distress, um, and it's associated with incident cognitive impairment and incident dementia. So if someone experiences delirium in hospital, say after a surgery, they're at increased risk, actually a ninefold risk of developing dementia uh, in the next 12 months. Delirium is also really expensive. So an Australian economic analysis of the 2016-17 financial year estimated that there are over 130,000 cases of delirium in that year. Over 900 deaths were attributable to delirium. And the total cost of delirium were nearly 9 billion Australian that financial year. Important in the context of this talk also, they estimated that about 11% of dementia cases in Australia were attributable to delirium. I'd like to cover one paper that I, I, I'm not a co-author on, but was led, um, well, a, a, a close colleague was involved with, uh, Professor Dan Davis, who is involved in much of the delirium work we do in Adelaide. Um, it was published last year in Age and Aging. There's been um, some debate in the last few decades about the role of hospitalisation and the role of delirium in future cognitive and functional decline in older people. It was traditionally thought that it's hospitalisation. So we know that if an older adult goes into hospital, they have a higher risk of decline in sort of the year or two after that hospitalisation period than someone, say, who didn't go into hospital. There was debate about whether that was being driven by delirium or hospitalisation or both. But this paper really took an innovative approach to demonstrate that it was actually delirium driving future decline, not hospitalisation. They did this by embedding themselves within an ongoing longitudinal cohort study that's population-based, the Cognitive Function and Ageing Study, or CFAS2, in the UK. They tracked um, nearly 2,000, so 1,751 older people. They had baseline cognition and dementia status because of this embedding within a large longitudinal study. Then for 12 months, they um, tracked every single one of those participants who entered a hospital and they measured delirium daily. So essentially after a 12 month follow-up, they had people who were hospitalized and experienced delirium in hospital. They had people who were hospitalized at least once but never experienced delirium in hospital and people who had never gone to hospital in that 12 month period. And what they found was that 40% of people who were hospitalized did develop delirium and that delirium was associated with cognitive decline over 12 months, nearly two MMSE points, and that delirium was in, associated with an increased risk of a new dementia diagnosis with an odds ratio of nearly nine. And all of these analyses were co-varied for illness severity, baseline cognition, age, gender, everything you would expect them to be co-varied for. So I think this is a lovely study to demonstrate the impact of delirium on future decline um, in older people. So to continue on, so why is delirium and dementia so, um, so interesting that and the relationship between the two? So it's interesting also because delirium actually appears partly preventable. So about 30% of delirium cases can be prevented, which is, which is amazing. Uh, there's a Cochrane review that's been published in 2016, but a whole lot of other um, studies have reported a, a rate that's relatively similar in the last few years, including a great Australian study. Um, so about 30% of delirium cases are preventable. So that actually means that delirium may be a modifiable risk factor for dementia and cognitive decline in late life. These interventions, however, are really expensive. 
they're at a surface level relatively simplistic, classic sort of multidisciplinary um, type approach. Things like making sure people are mobile, that they're hydrated, eating well, that they are cognitively engaged, that they're getting some sleep all of these things, but you can imagine that it's quite intensive and therefore expensive to run. So if we can identify those at high risk for delirium, we can target the interventions, which is going to be more cost effective. So that's the sort of background to the work that's um, been done and or has been done and is being done right now in our lab in Adelaide. So now I'd like to talk you through two studies I did with Professor Dan Davis sort of leading up to the work um, that's ongoing. Um, I'd like to talk you through the way we, we think about the work that we're, is currently underway and talk to you sort of about three main themes of work we're doing. So indexing risk for delirium, intervening in delirium and understanding the neurophysiology of delirium. So I'm just going to talk you through two studies that um, Dan really led um, from work when I was working in the UK and as he was and still is. Uh, so they're looking at population-based cohort studies with autopsy programs. So people attract um, longitudinally as they age and then people donate their brains at death. And this first paper, which was actually published 10 years ago now, uh, reported on a Finnish cohort study with over 500 uh, participants who had been tracked and had donated their brain at death. And being Finnish, they had lovely medical records. And Dan went and classified people as having ever had delirium through the study, having never have had delirium through the study. Uh, and then if they had a clinical diagnosis of dementia at death, then we looked at really classical neuropathologies associated with dementia. So we've got bright stage, so that's tau, amyloid, infarcts, severe neuronal loss, alpha synuclein, and APOE E4 allele status. So sort of a pathology, but you know, a real strong marker, a genetic risk mark marker for Alzheimer's disease. You can see with the black estimates. Um, that they all float over an odds ratio of one and most of the confidence intervals don't touch one, which means that all of those pathologies were associated with having a diagnosis of clinical dementia at death. That makes sense. These are pathologies associated with dementia. You would think that they would be associated with having a clinical dementia diagnosis at death in this cohort. And there, that's the black uh, dots. When we break up the cohort, relative to those who did have delirium, that's red, to those who never had delirium, blue, we can see that there's quite a different pattern. So these associations between pathologies and a clinical diagnosis of dementia maintain or actually a little bit stronger for those uh, who never had delirium, the blue um, dots. Uh, you can see those who did have delirium, the red dots, they're pretty, you know, they're floating about one and the confidence intervals are huge. So what we saw here is that delirium is a really strong risk factor for incident um, dementia in the oldest old. We saw sort of a similar odds ratio um, as the recent UK study, nearly nine, but it doesn't appear to be driven by classical neuropathologies associated with dementia. We continued, um, this sort of line of inquiry, well, Dan, Dan leading this, uh, and looking across three cohorts, all uh, population-based cohort studies, longitudinal with autopsy programs. And this time collapsing over three, we had uh, nearly a thousand uh, participants with autopsy data. And instead of looking at clinical dementia as an outcome, we looked at cognitive decline. And in this paper, which you can look up if you're, if you're interested, what we found is that when we modeled cognitive decline as the outcome, uh, having neuropathology uh, contributed, had a significant effect as you'd expect, um, but also delirium did, and delirium and neuropathology actually had a significant interaction in, um, when having cognitive decline as an outcome. And it really illustrates the multiplicative nature of delirium and neuropathology to cognitive decline. 
So as I was introduced, I came back to um, Australia about uh, a decade ago now from some postdoc work in the UK. And at the time, I and you know most other dementia and cognitive aging researchers were really interested in the effects of, of vascular health, especially vascular health in midlife, on cognitive performance and dementia in late life. We know that, you know, depending on what estimate you read, but about 30 to 50% of late life dementia cases can be prevented uh, if we uh, tackled modifiable risk factors. And many of these modifiable risk factors are related to vascular health. So you have this interesting relationship between the accrual of vascular burdens or you know, vascular ill health across adulthood, leading to an increased risk of cognitive impairments and dementia in late life. And when I arrived in Adelaide, I was speaking to lots of cardiologists, and of course, they also see uh, this relationship where if you have poor vascular health in midlife, you're also at far greater um, risk of needing a cardiac procedure in late life, which can also lead to cognitive decline and dementia. So um, I have also put two common cardiac procedures here. So TAVI and uh, cabbage, everyone asks when they hear the acronym cabbage, but this is transaortic valve implantation and coronary artery bypass grafting. So I'm gonna use those acronyms a bit, TAVI and cabbage, but please just know that they're common cardiac procedures um, in older adults. So most of our work has looked at these two procedures. We're trying to broaden out a little bit as we move on and even move out of the cardiac field. But most of our work so far has really been embedded within cardiac units in Adelaide. Um, first of all, driven by an interest in the relationship between vascular burden and cognitive health, but also due to clinical relationships and partnerships. So um, what I'm particularly interested uh, in this uh, sort of diagram is the effect of delirium. So of course, if you have a cardiac procedure, risk of delirium, and that delirium itself can lead to cognitive decline and dementia. So it's these um, the sort of thick arrows that is sort of the focus of our research, trying to predict who will develop delirium and then if someone develops delirium, what, is, what are the long-term outcomes? So some individuals are more at risk of developing delirium. So why are we focusing on this delirium vulnerability? So the risk for future incident delirium. That's really been our focus so far. And you know, pretty much comes down to that's what we seem to be most interested in because I think um, it's a really, really interesting area. I think that we're focused on this sort of delirium vulnerability. So trying to identify people at high risk, then we can target those interventions. We're also interested in trying to differentiate the sort of the neurophysiology, the neuropathology and the neuropsychology of dementia and delirium. And that's because yes, when um, someone has a surgery and they may or may not develop delirium after, you can understand their baseline cognitive and dementia status before the surgery. But most often, most delirium cases are presenting to acute care settings, and that clinician may or may not know if that person has dementia. So we need to understand what are the factors that are associated with dementia, what are the factors that are associated with delirium, and what are the factors that are associated with both so we can start to improve you know, clinical diagnosis and therefore care. We also want to understand the development of delirium without confounding factors associated with the acute insult itself. When we try and look at the cognitive and neurophysiological bases of delirium, they're also clouded, or well, they have a lot of variability, a lot of heterogeneity because of the different um, acute insults that are leading to that delirium, whether it be a systemic infection, whether it be surgical factors, you also are measuring those factors as well as delirium. So measuring before those factors come into play is, um, gives you a bit of a cleaner signal. And also we're really interested in trying to refine and extend theories of delirium. Theories of delirium are, are lagging behind other sort of psychiatric conditions 
a lot of other psychiatric conditions have their sort of preclinical phase or their vulnerability phase very well characterised. If we're to think about dementia having the MCI diagnosis, uh, classification systems, um, people at high risk of psychosis, a lot of those other psychiatric conditions have their sort of uh, people who are vulnerable well characterised and delirium is just not there yet in, in theory or practice. So in the last few years, we've done a lot of systematic reviews. Now, I love systematic reviews and meta-analyses as it is. Uh, we've probably done a fair, fair few more than we planned because of the global pandemic. Uh, of course, Tavi and Cabbage, the two major procedures we've been focusing on, are, and we're looking at elective patients, have been uh, severely disrupted in the last two years. So probably done more meta-analyses than we planned, but I think they're all really interesting. Um, we've started off with um, just developing an evidence base. So just if we're to look at the TAVI and CABBAGE patients across all the literature in, um, published so far, what is the incidence of delirium in these groups and what's the incidence of, of cognitive decline? So I've put three of our meta-analyses from the last few years addressing those questions. Uh, and what we find actually really interestingly because um, people think of TAVI and cabbage patient groups in quite sort of different contexts, but actually we find pretty much identical uh, incident delirium rates of about 25%. So one in four older adults undergoing these procedures appears to experience delirium. And cognitive de decline thereafter is seen as sort of mm, like 10 to 40%, but that's sort of dependent on when you're measuring it and how you're measuring it. So one of our themes of um, our current work is can we develop tools to index delirium risk better? So there are ways to index delirium risk right now. There's, there are multiple tools. In fact, there's a, a systematic review published two years ago uh, summarising all of these tools, but they're not performing as well as we would hope. So they're adequate, but they're not fantastic and can we find better ways to index risks so someone going into an elective surgery knows that they're at high risk or low risk for delirium and their clinical care team knows and so their care can be planned and they can be you know informed of all of the risks that are ahead of them so we're running a um, clinical or observational clinical trial in TAVI patients at the moment in Adelaide trying to identify new factors associated with delirium most of those um, relate to sort of frailty measures. And um, uh, so we've got gait and we've got some interesting ones um, related to eye movements and, and things like that. We've also run a meta-analysis recently that's under review that's looked at factors that differentiate delirium motor subtypes. And I really hope this is out soon because I think it's really exciting and it, it, we've got a number of factors that seem to differentiate between the subtypes that can be measured before someone undergoes a surgery. So wouldn't it be great if we not only knew who was at risk, but who, you know, which subtype they might um, develop, because obviously the clinical care can be radically different. Uh, it also plays into a sort of a lot of clinical assumptions, but we've sort of shown it empirically for the first time, that those at risk for hypoactive delirium subtype are typically older, frailer, and more likely to be female. And those at high risk for hyperactive delirium are more likely to be younger, physically fit, and male. So uh, this is sort of almost colloquially known um, or understood, but we've been, been able to provide some um, numbers towards those estimates. We've also done a number of meta-analyses looking at risk factors uh, across the literature, and most recently, we've published a neuropsychological profile of delirium vulnerability. So looking across all the literature uh, that measured cognition before an acute insult and delirium after an acute insult and tied those data together to see what the pattern of cognitive performance was um, between those who did and didn't develop delirium. I thought I'd just briefly go over that meta-analysis at a very sort of surface level, but it is published and so anyone interested can, can read it. I probably need to preface this is that 
uh, it's known that the two biggest risk factors for delirium, for developing delirium, is age. So if you're older, you're far, far more likely to develop delirium. And if you have poor cognition or, you know, if you have dementia, you're at high risk for developing delirium after an acute insult. But most of the work has been embedded within clinical medicine and geriatrics, not in cognitive psychology. And so most of the measures have been quite uh, brief global cognitive measures. But what we wanted to do, because we're doing some work of our, on our own data, is try to understand, are there sort of different patterns of performance across the cognitive domains? So we looked, we used the um, Lazac, uh, the edited book by Lazac, Principles of Neuropsychological Assessment. And we went through all the literature. Uh, I think there was about 60 studies that measured cognition, but they did it they didn't just present a global measure. They either presented subscales from a global cognitive um, measure or they actually did cognitive domain specific tests. And we classified them into the seven cognitive domains. And we found actually that they weren't sort of equally uh, predicting who would and who wouldn't develop delirium. Uh, orientation had a large effect size. I put it in a big red circle. So, and it was significant. I've actually put the ones that didn't reach statistical significance as, as transparent. A medium effect size for construction and motor performance. Perception also had a medium effect size, but wasn't statistically significant. And then we had small effects for language, memory, attention, and executive function. So you can see here that it's not just sort of all cognitive domains are equally you know, poor performance and all cognitive domains are predictive of developing delirium in the future, it really seems to be biased towards orientation. So people who can't place themselves in space and time. So in a clinical application of this could be that maybe the global cognitive measures aren't as sensitive as they could be. Maybe you just wanna test orientation if you're doing sort of a broad brush approach. We did a number of subgroup analyses as well. And I'm just gonna present one here. So we split the literature relative to those that excluded baseline cognition, uh, cognitive um, impairments, including dementia, and studies that didn't. So we never had a group that only had cognitive impairment at baseline, which would have been great, but unfortunately not possible. But some interesting patterns of effects emerged. So those studies that excluded for baseline cognitive impairment and dementia, um, actually the, the it's really executive function that's predictive of those um, who develop delirium. So those who perform poorly on executive function tests are at higher risk for developing delirium. That orientation effect was no longer statistically significant and all the other effects were either small or not statistically significant. So executive function in sort of cognitively healthy people, impairments in executive function appears to be quite predictive of delirium. In the mixed group, so those, we, you know, we don't have, um, you know, it's mixed for people who have cognitive impairments and don't, it seemed to be motor and construction performance. So I think, you know, we're doing our own work right now, but I think in those who are cognitively healthy, executive function tests are going to be um, better at predicting who is at high risk for delirium. And in those with cognitive impairments, it's going to be more so construction and motor performance tests like the clock drawing task. Uh, so perhaps we could improve the sensitivity of these delirium risk prediction tools by having cognitive tests that know if someone has, you know, underlying dementia or not. Another theme of our research is trying to intervene. So can we actually prevent delirium? Can we prevent cognitive decline after a delirium episode? We have a clinical trial that's on, ongoing in cabbage patients that uses cognitive training before cabbage, so a prehabilitation. And that's anywhere between sort of a week or three weeks of cognitive training, three times a week. And then we have a, a block of training after the cabbage. So it starts about one month after, after they've recovered and it goes for three months. And then we measure them a month after, which is six months. So they've had a bit of a break. What th these data were actually taken from an unsuccessful MRFF application last year. Uh, so it's the first 22 cabbage patients and these effects may or may not bear out in the larger, larger sample. But what we've found here is that there was a lower delirium, incident delirium rate 
in those who underwent the cognitive training before the surgery. And on two um, measures, one an executive function task and one an associative learning task, we saw that there was better cognitive performance at six months in the cognitive training group as compared to the control group who had no, no intervention, it was just normal care. So this is really promising. We're still ongoing. The data collection is still ongoing for this study, obviously hugely disrupted over um, the multiple uh, lockdowns and pauses on elective surgery here in South Australia. But really um, interesting results and we hope, hope to have more data soon. And I'll talk later about what we're also interested in doing in the future is trying to do um, an intervention after a delirium episode, but targeting those who do develop delirium in hospital. But I'll speak more about that later. The last theme I'm gonna to touch on is trying to capture brain vulnerability for delirium. So I come from a cognitive neuroscience background. So I always love to understand brain structure and brain function in relation to diagnoses. So embedded within all of our studies, we actually collect electrical brain data, so EEG, and then, and that's before the surgery. So again, trying to capture this brain vulnerability for delirium, not during the delirium episode itself. Then we measure delirium in hospital after an acute insult, which is tabby or cabbage, and then we link the data. So we kind of retrospectively allocate groups based on what delirium, if they developed delirium and if they developed delirium, what subtype was it? Uh, in a retrospective manner. This is informed by a systematic re we review we published a few years ago, where we surveyed the whole literature and understood what has been done with EEG measures and delirium. And no study has ever looked at subtype, which is a massive oversight, and only two studies that were very small in scale had looked at EEG measures before a delirium episode. And the protocol for this study has been published, I think last year, it's called the Delirium Vulnerability in Geriatrics or Divulge Study. These data are also taken from pilot data for a grant application, so not published yet and data collection is still ongoing. Uh, and unless you know, I'm not gonna go into the ins and outs of EEG, but what I've got here are some data from eyes closed and during a very basic cognitive task called the auditory oddball. And in fact, there's no overt responses. It's um, a way really to index attentional and predictive processing. And I've split the data up relative to those who didn't go on to develop delirium, who went on to develop hyperactive delirium and who went on to develop hypoactive delirium. And it doesn't really matter <laughs> um, what these squiggles are, but I'd like to note that the squiggles are do show some differences. They're not sort of on top of each other. We're actually starting to see that we can index brain vulnerability for delirium and what subtype they, um, of delirium before someone even um, shows delirium themselves. So these data were collected a week or two before the surgery or procedure. So I, I think it's remarkable that we can see these differences emerging in, in this initial pilot data. Um, and let's see if the effects bear out, but it's really interesting the pattern so far that we're seeing a sort of um, brain responses that um, indicate sort of hypoarousal in the people who go on to, to develop hypoactive delirium. And we're seeing neurophysiological indices of hyperactivity or hyperarousal in those who go on to develop hyperactive delirium. So this is another area of ongoing work and hopefully these data will be out sometime soon. So to wrap up and to look to the future, I hope I've told you enough that you think that delirium is a common and distressing condition associated with many poor outcomes in older people, including dementia. Um, in the future, uh, in our group, we're gonna continue to identify the neurophysiology and neuropsychology of delirium vulnerability with a continual focus on subtypes. We're also hoping in the future uh, grant money, you know, if that comes through, to co-design and test a multidisciplinary intervention post-delirium to prevent decline after a delirium episode. It's increasingly 
obvious that although the delirium prevention measures are very effective, sometimes they're very difficult to implement into acute care. And at the end of the day, even if some are preventable, a whole whack of people do develop delirium in hospital and it's associated with very poor outcomes. So our hope in the future is start to co-design and then test an intervention where we can actually do a multidisciplinary intervention after a delirium episode, episode to try and hopefully um, prevent future dementia from delirium. So please get in touch if you're interested in collaborating or if you have any questions about the papers I've touched on today. Um, and thanks to the whole research group, this photo is a little bit out of date because we haven't managed to have a on mass photo in the, you know, recently. Um, but I'd like to point out um, Professor Dan Davis, who uh, really is instrumental in all of our delirium work. And then Erica Gezi, who's a research assistant in the group. She is a meta-analysis extraordinaire. Uh, Danny Greaves, who's just finished her PhD. She ran the, and started up the cognitive training study. And um, Monique Board is a PhD student running the Devolve study. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hannah. Uh, we now have some time for Q&A. Uh, if you have any questions, please submit them now through the chat function. Um, alternatively, if you'd like to ask your question in person, you can turn on your camera and microphone and we'll call on you in turn. Um, Hannah, would you perhaps mind uh, stop sharing your screen just so yeah, we will do. see everyone a little bit more clearly in case people want to ask a question. Well, I guess while we wait uh, for some questions to come in, I, I might have a few. Yeah. Um, I was particularly interested in your, your future research about co-designing uh, intervention um, for, for people um, who, who have already experienced delirium. What, what kind of aspects of co-design are you looking for there? Just tell me all about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know, I, don't, I mean, I, I feel, I know you're the masters of co-design at NARI, so, you know, I don't, I don't want, you know, feedback is always welcome but we have we do embed consumer engagement into all of our studies so whether informally in developing research questions but we've also just recently published like a more formal like um focus group mixed method study of that cognitive training intervention which was a good exercise as well so uh well in in terms of that that particular um project is a grant application at the moment and who knows if we'll get off the ground but actually the research question was um, developed through co-design so we actually had um, people come in and talk about their hospital experiences and how they felt after being discharged from hospital and in the design we're actually co-designing the intervention with um, older adults who have experienced a hospital stay recently uh, so yeah I really hope we get to do it because I think it's a really an exciting uh, project and I think uh, working on strategies for uh, rehabilitation after delirium will be a really big focus in the future in the field. Great. Uh, Sue, do you have a question for Hannah? Yeah, thank you. Um, Hannah, that's a fabulous presentation. Thank you. And some amazing um, like diversity of papers, but also um, coming together in a great story um, mm. as well. So I just um, I uh, would like to just ask a couple of questions about the tools and this mm. particularly with the um, the group who you're considering not cognitively impaired and yet what you're able to distinguish is that actually in executive function there's a difference between those who will go on to have dementia versus not is that and, and that's how I've interpreted it so is yes, there, you saying they're within normal range but there there's a two different cohorts of executive function or not? So I just would like you to explain that a bit more. Thanks. Yeah, no, it's a really good question. And explaining meta-analyses in two slides at such a surface level is probably a terrible thing to do. But what we've done, is it's a meta-analysis, so we're totally constrained by what's been published in the past. So what we did is looked at those who do and don't go on to develop delirium, not dementia. Uh, so in those studies where they excluded people with dementia, so or any sort of cognitive impairment, that was differently defined across the studies, but let's call them a healthy cognitive group. Uh, poor performance in executive function had the largest and statistically significant uh, association with developing delirium in the future. So I think 
that is, so it's not that um, they met a threshold for poor performance, but essentially if you get a bunch of cognitively healthy people, those who perform poorly on an executive function test will be more likely to develop delirium after a surgery. And I think there's multiple reasons. I think the orientation effect, I mean, most orientation questions are, you know, do you know where you are? Do you know what time of day it is? Do you know what date it is? I think those questions, are the healthy, cognitively healthy people are just getting right. There's no discriminatory sort of value in those questions, yet we do them all the time to everyone. Um, so I think the point of ours is that in a cognitively healthy people, doing those type of orientation questions isn't going to be useful. You should be doing sort of executive function tests to try and index who is at risk or who isn't at risk for delirium. So in a way, pre-op, you do instead, as well as doing your blood pressure and your whatever, you also do a executive function test, even, you know, even a clock drawing or a mocker or something like that. So mostly the, um, like a, a trail making test. So the test B of trail making, sort of one to A, two to B, three to C. The clock drawing is actually a construction and motor performance test. So that would be more for people who have a cognitive impairment, that's gonna be a good test. Great, does that answer both of your questions, Sue? Great. Uh, Deborah, uh, you've turned your microphone on. Do you have a question for Hannah? No, but well, you might have... sure. Sorry, that was, um, no, I don't, I'm sorry. Oh, radio, that's all right. I um, can see one through the chat by Kylie. I'm happy to yes. read that out, but also Kylie wants to join, but curious regarding the impact of medications used preoperatively, yes with respect to vulnerability to delirium and type of delirium post cardiac surgery. Yeah, there's massive, I mean, anticholinergic medication have a huge effect on, on cognition and dementia, especially um, sort of uh, psychotropic anticholinergic medications. And I think bladder um, anticholinergic medications. There has been a little bit of work um, and, but we, and we have collected medication data. We just haven't looked at it yet. But yes, uh, a lot of medications put people at risk for uh, delirium and especially anticholinergic medications. Uh, but yes, we have collected these data, but we haven't analysed them ourselves yet. We also haven't intervened. So we, we haven't tried to sort of de-prescribe things in people. Uh, I think an interesting one is that... Uh, that I, is interesting because depression is such a big risk factor for delirium and it's uh be yeah yes is also perhaps a risk factor for delirium but it might be interesting these effects might be having different these medications might be having different effects in different subgroups of people thank you for your question kylie um so hannah you you were mentioning that there are uh, different profiles between people vulnerable to hypo and hyper mm. um condition subtypes of delirium I also noticed that the third subtype there was mixed mm. uh, how difficult is it to try and 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 get demographic information about the condition which kind of reaches into both of those aspects yeah we actually we did look at the mixed in that review I just didn't um didn't go into it and yeah hopefully we get the comments back and we can get it out into the world soon uh, so they seem to be more similar to the hyperactive group than the hypoactive group in terms of those demographic profiles. Uh, but, it, you know, it, it is an interesting group. Unfortunately, it's, it is the group in the minority. So in terms of prevalence, it's typically in most studies uh, the smallest number of people. So it is hard to get good estimates. You have to have a really large study to, to have the power to look at the mixed group. But certainly in the, that particular paper that's under review, we did find differences between the mixed group and the other two subtypes it, and kind of sits in the middle of the hypo kind of profile of older people, um, frailer, more likely to be women versus a hyperactive subtype, which is younger, fitter, less comorbidities and more likely to be male. Um, well, do we have any more questions uh, for Hannah? Well, thanks for having me and do reach out if you've got any other questions or you'd like a paper and can't access it.
Yep. Well, everyone, uh, please join me in thanking Hannah with your clap reactions. Um, and next fortnight, um, please join us on Tuesday, the 26th of April uh, from midday. And thank you for attending our Seminars in Aging program. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. Well, thank you, Hannah. Um, well, let me just stop the pause, stop the recording. <laughs>